Well, those of you who know me know that I really like history. I love history. It was my minor in college, specifically church history. I love studying history when it's rightly taught. Sadly, our world is reinterpreting and reinventing history, but thanks to primary sources and primary documents and eyewitness testimony, we can still piece together concrete events that actually happened in history. And perhaps you've done this. You've looked up historical events that happened on your birthday. Maybe you've been curious about your date of birth and have wondered what happened on my birthday in history. Or maybe I'm the only weird one who's done that, but maybe some of you have, and that's cool. I see my birthday is June 25th, and I always thought that I got the best birthday. Growing up as a kid, I lucked out. I had the best birthday because I could expect presents on a six-month cycle. June 25th, December 25th. As far as I was concerned, I had it made. Every six months, I was guaranteed presents. So if I didn't get something that I wanted for my birthday, I just, you know, want ask for it for Christmas because that's, you know, the point of Christmas, right? No. But I looked up what happened historically on June 25th, and it's not a very exciting day. Not many things happen on June 25th, with, with one major exception. June 25th, 1876, and maybe you know your Wild West history. I like Wild West history very much. June 25th, 1876 was the Battle of Little Bighorn, or what you might know it as Custer's Last Stand. See, George Armstrong Custer led a force of over 500 U.S. cavalry and troops against an enemy he thought he would easily defeat. But instead of the Native Americans that he thought he would easily conquer, an alliance of over 1,800 Lakota and Cheyenne warriors met him in battle. Custer's forces were outnumbered. He misjudged his enemy. And he and his troops were destroyed. Apart from a few straggling survivors, every last man in Custer's force was completely cut down. Custer was the cavalry. You've heard that phrase, the cavalry's coming. The cavalry's on the way. Custer was the cavalry. For Custer and his troops, help didn't come. No help came. The Lakota and the Cheyenne defeated them. It was one of the only major victories that Native American forces won in their sad struggle against the United States government in a sad chapter in our country's history. Help never came for Custer. But for you, Christian, help is on the way. If you are a genuine believer in Christ, life is getting harder for you. And it's going to look different for every single one of you. We are largely shielded here in America. In certain parts of America, things are getting a little more intense for Christians, depending on Christians' convictions and what positions they hold on things. But I'd say on the whole, in the 50 United States, we have it pretty easy. But we know around the world, things have been difficult for quite some time. Uh, If you listen to or read any material from Voice of the Martyrs or other ministries like that, you know that Christians around the world are persecuted daily for their faith. In fact, if you've kept on top of anything that's happening right now in Afghanistan, which is tragic, uh, the Taliban is regaining ground, and it's not just political or militarily. Uh, I saw a tweet the other night from a Christian who's connected to believers in Afghanistan. Believers in Afghanistan have been contacted by the Taliban with threats saying, we know who you are, we know where you meet, and we're coming for you. Brothers and sisters around the world are facing hardship, and this shouldn't be a surprise to us. It's tragic. We don't want to be trivial or flippant. It is tragic. Jesus did promise us, though, in John 16, in this world, you will have trouble. Guaranteed. Not you might have trouble, you will have trouble. Paul writes to Timothy, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, persecution. If your faith has never cost you anything, you need to ask, do I have real faith? True faith comes at a cost. That cost comes sometimes in the sorrows that we sang about, sorrows that, you know, sometimes our sorrow comes from our own sin and consequences from our own sin. Sometimes our sorrow comes from living just in a cursed world with natural disasters and illnesses, things that are natural evils. But sometimes sorrow comes from hardship, 
persecution. Maybe family members have ostracized you because you're too fanatical or too zealous for Jesus. Maybe distant family members or relatives think you have joined a cult or you're too serious about Jesus or you've been brainwashed by that church or indoctrinated by that church or you take this Jesus stuff too seriously or you hold to a too outdated and narrow-minded view on the inerrancy and inspiration and authority of the scripture. Whatever it is, you may be cut off from friends at work. Some of my high school students in the youth ministry have told me how hard it is at public schools at times to take a stand for righteousness when you know it will be, it will be the end of your social credit. You won't be invited to many more hangouts or parties. You'll be labeled a goody two-shoes. Whatever it looks like, I hope at some extent or another your faith has cost you something. And even though it's to be expected, it's still hard. It's still difficult and can be painful. What hope is there for the faithful Christian? All the hope in the world. Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 through 13 is our text for this morning. The title of today's sermon is Holding Out for a Hero. Holding Out for a Hero. I I love 80s music. Holding out for a hero. Revelation 3, 7 through 13, Jesus' message to the church in Philadelphia. Jesus says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Well, we're back in our study of the letters to the churches of Revelation, really our study of Revelation. As long as Bart allows me, I'll just keep chipping away. Uh, At this rate, though, I I think we'll probably be history by the time we get done, but that's okay. I'd rather much have you guys learn from Jesus directly in heaven than learn from me here on earth. Uh, But we're making our way through Revelation. If you remember the context of chapters 2 and 3, which really began in chapter 1, John on the island of Patmos in exile, an old man sentenced to hard labor to break rocks in the hot sun because of his faithfulness to Jesus Christ, probably thought his life was done and over, probably thought he would die from physical exhaustion and overwork there on that prison colony, Patmos in the middle of the Mediterranean. But one day, on a Sunday, in fact, he said he was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, which is Sunday, he received a vision. He saw a vision of the resurrected and glorified Jesus Christ that knocked him face down flat in awe. And Jesus had at least one last job for John to do. Now, church history tells us that John was released from exile and returned to Ephesus and lived out his days ministering and pastoring his beloved church in Ephesus. But what this book tells us is that the last task that we know Jesus gave John to do was to write, write what he saw, the things that were and the things that will come to pass. And chapters two and three consist of seven letters to these seven churches in modern-day Turkey, what was known then as Asia Minor. These seven churches lay along a major postal route that began in Ephesus on the southwest coast and went in a clockwise manner, starting in Ephesus, moving up to Smyrna, then Pergamum, then Thyatira, Sardis, and Philadelphia, and ending in Laodicea. We come to the sixth church, Philadelphia, today. The sixth church, 
on that postal route. Philadelphia is one of the two good churches. The other church being that of Smyrna. Ephesus, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, and Laodicea all at least had one major issue. Something significantly wrong that needed to be addressed. Ephesus, on the whole, was a good church. Ephesus was a church that held a sound doctrine, that was active in ministry, that was faithful in reaching out to its community, but it had slipped into that insidious trap of losing its first love, missing the focus, forgetting that Christianity is about loving Christ. 1 Peter 1.8 tells us, true Christians, though you have not seen him, you love him. And then flip it around, 1 Corinthians 16, 22, Paul says, if any man has no love for the Lord, let that man be accursed. The essence of true, genuine, authentic Christianity is not a creed you affirm to, though doctrine is important. But underneath that, what is foundational is love for the Savior. Selfless, sacrificial, die to yourself, take up your cross, follow him, love for the Savior. Ephesus had started to drift didn't mean that they lost their salvation. It just mean they lost their focus. The problem in Pergamum and Thyatira was more dire. They had started to tolerate sin and even in some cases pat themselves on the back for how tolerant they were. Tolerance of sin is not a new problem. It goes back 2,000 years. The temptation to think that you are so-called loving or kind because you turn a blind eye to iniquity does not make you righteous. It actually puts you in the scope of God's ire. Pergamum and Thyatira had started to tolerate sin. The situation in both Sardis and Laodicea was even worse. Self-deception and rampant, unregenerate People filling pews saying that they were Christians were characteristic of Sardis and Laodicea. Those are the two churches that are on either side of the church of Philadelphia. But in the middle of the muck of Sardis and Laodicea, we have faithful Philadelphia. Philadelphia, like Smyrna, is experiencing persecution. Hardship from those who say that they're righteous with God. We'll talk about this synagogue of Satan in a little bit those who think that they are right with God and yet are truly opposing God, much like Paul did before he was saved, when he was still Saul of Tarsus, throwing Christians into prison, and Jesus shows up and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Philadelphia was experiencing much that same type of persecution. And from this passage, we can take great hope about how to press on and endure In fact, looking at this text, we see three questions which help us understand and apply Jesus' message to the Philadelphians. I want to present to you three questions this morning to help you analyze this text so that you can obey this text. We do want to study the Word of God, but not just study the Word of God so that we can fill our heads. We want to do it so we can fill our weeks with obedience. We study so that we can take it into heart and walk in obedience. We want to both understand and apply. The first question to help us understand and apply that we look at this text is who is Jesus in relation to the faithful Christian? The Lord reveals aspects about himself and about his character to these suffering believers that give them hope. Who is Jesus in relation to the faithful Christian? And notice it says to the faithful Christian, just as a side note, many of you know this, the Bible was not written to you, but it was written for you. This letter was specifically written to the Philadelphians. It was not written to the Hutchinsonians. I, I actually, I don't even know. Is that our de- de- demonym? Man, I'm doing it too, Chuck. Is that the name of people who live in Hutch? Hutchinsonians? Someone can correct me later. Kansans. How about that? That's correct. It wasn't written to Kansans, but it was written for Kansans. That's how the Bible works. Galatians was written, was written to the Galatians at a specific point in time. Philippians was written to the Philippians at a specific point in time to address certain issues. Blake, Pastor Blake talked about this when he talked about the book of Philemon. That was literally written to Philemon. But though it wasn't written to you, it was written for you. And because the word of God is unlike any other book that's ever been written, it is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. It speaks through the centuries to you in a way that no other book can. And it speaks to us today. So as the Philadelphians were faithful Christians, if you too are a genuine, born again, walking with Christ, faithful Christian, this message is for you. And who Jesus was to them, he is to you. Who was he to them? Well, first and foremost, he is fully divine. He is fully divine. He begins by saying, 
to the angel, it's the messenger, the lead pastor of the church, the called out ones in Philadelphia, the words of the Holy One, fully divine, defines, identifies himself as the Holy One. He said, I know what holy means. It means set apart, unstained from sin, set apart unto something for a specific purpose, consecrated, clean, untouched by evil. And that is all true. Positionally, that's true of you, Christian. Progressively, we trust that that is true as you walk in obedience and mortify your sin and grow in Christ. And it is true perfectly of Jesus. But the Holy One is an actual title. That construct where you have a definite article, the adjective holy, and the noun one is a title. 28 times it shows up in the book of Isaiah. The Holy One of Israel. The Holy One of Israel. It's one of Isaiah's favorite terms for Yahweh, for the God of the universe. That same term is picked up in the Gospels, both by a demon in Mark chapter 1, and by Peter in John chapter 6, when they refer to Jesus Christ as the Holy One of God. It is a specific title. And by applying it to Jesus, by Jesus taking it unto himself, he's clearly saying, suffering Philadelphians, don't forget, I am God. What does Paul tell us in the book of Romans? If God is for us, who can be against us? What are you up against? Persecution? Hardship? Maybe the internal torment of doubt? Struggling? Fighting to hold on to hope when it feels like your life is falling apart? I think a lot about our high school students. This week, several of our students are going off to college. Some going to Christian colleges, some going to secular schools, some going to trade schools, wherever you go. It doesn't, doesn't matter if it's the best Christian college on the face of the planet or the most pagan secular university, you have to be a Berean. You can't just take anything for granted. And I sometimes think about our seniors who I love and care for. I can't be with them. I know as much as I care for them, their parents care for them even more. You can't be with them. But God's always with them. The Holy One. Yahweh. The King of kings and Lord of lords. If God is for us, who can be against us? He is fully divine, faithful Christian. Secondly, who is he to you? He's absolutely trustworthy. Not only is he the Holy One, he is the true one. The words of the Holy One, the true one. Revelation 19, he shows up again, the Lord Jesus Christ, or the rider on the white horse, to defeat the false rider on the white horse, who appears in Rev 6, the Antichrist, the counterfeit Messiah. Jesus shows up with a name written on him, faithful and true, trustworthy, reliable, Never, ever, ever lies. Hebrews tells us that it is impossible for God to lie. You can trust him. And when life is easy, you say, well, yeah, of course I can trust him. But it's in the moment of sorrow, like what we sang about, from the sorrow I call, when things are hard, when you lose a loved one, or you lose a job, or you see your children walk away from the faith, or any other difficulty going on in your life, and you're praying, Lord, take the thorn, take the thorn, take the thorn, and it stays, it gets hard in those moments to trust what you know to be true because the pain feels so real, and you question, ah, oh, God, I know what you say, and I know that you say your promises, you withhold no good thing from those who walk uprightly, and yet my life is falling apart. Trust the one who's true. It's been said, do not doubt in the dark what you held to in the light. So suffering Christian, faithful Christian, remember that the one speaking to you is fully divine. Remember that the one speaking to you is absolutely trustworthy. And then cling to also the fact that he is exclusively omnipotent. He is exclusively omnipotent. The holy one, the true one, the one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. If you remember from Matthew 16, when Peter confesses that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, he says, Blessed are you, Peter, son of Jonah. For flesh did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I tell you, on this rock I'll build my church, and I will give to you the keys of heaven. The keys symbolize pastoral authority, not papal authority. I don't want to go on a church history tangent here. But they symbolize pastoral authority. 
keys in both the Old and the New Testament are symbolic of being in charge. I know this because when we changed the locks at the church, all the pastors still had keys, and I started getting a lot more texts. Hey, uh, can you, you know, so keys actually represent some type of authority. It's a level of power. I usually would just tell people to text Hadley. <laughs> just kidding. He is exclusively omnipotent. He has the keys of David. He opens and no one will shut. He shuts and no one will open. That is a unique phrase, and you may wonder, why does he say that? Well, it's a callback, again, to one of John's favorite books of the Bible, the book of Isaiah. Flip over to Isaiah 22. In one of Isaiah's many prophecies about the future of the southern kingdom of Judah, Isaiah, who's writing in the 700s, foresees a coming ruler of Judah, not the great Messiah, a lesser ruler, before the time of the exile, a man named Eliakim. Verse 20 of Isaiah 22. The Lord says through Isaiah, In that day I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with your robe, and I will bind your sash on him, and will commit your authority to his hand, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. Remember, authority. He shall open and none shall shut. He shall shut and none shall open. And I will fasten him like a peg in a secure place, and he'll become a throne of honor to his father's house. And they will hang on him the whole honor of his father's house, the offspring and issue, every small vessel, from the cups to all the flagons. You say, wow, that sounds pretty good. Well, hold on. Remember a big picture of the Old Testament. You could sum up the whole Old Testament from Genesis 3.15 until the voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. The whole Old Testament intertestinal period can be summed up with the phrase, this ain't the guy. Because ever since Genesis 3.15, starting with Seth, well really with Cain, and then with Seth, and then with Noah, and then with Enoch, and on and on and on, all of the judges, David, Solomon, is this the guy? No, this ain't the guy. Is this the guy? No, this isn't the snake crusher. This isn't the curse breaker. This isn't the Eden restorer. Verse 25, in that day, declares the Lord of hosts, the peg that was fastened in a secure place will give way and it will be cut down and fall and the low that was on it will be cut off for the Lord has spoken. Eliakim, just like David, just like Noah, just like Moses, just like Seth, just like Cain, was not the guy, not the Messiah, not the curse breaker, not the snake crusher. But Jesus is. It stops there with Jesus. Where Eliakim failed, he had the keys of David, he failed, Jesus doesn't. He has all powerful. He has all strength. None can challenge him. He is exclusively omnipotent. Fourth, he is completely omniscient. He says, I know your works. Now that phrase should sound familiar from our studies in Thyatira and Pergamum. And in those churches, that would have been a scary phrase because those churches were harboring hypocrisy. And in a room this size, I undoubtedly know that someone here, I don't know who, there's got to be someone who's harboring hypocrisy. The omniscience of God should frighten and scare the secret sinner. But to the faithful Christian, not the perfect person, because the perfect person doesn't exist, but the one who identifies, confesses, repents, and turns from their sin, who keeps, as Jonathan Edwards says, short accounts with God. You keep short accounts with God, the omniscience of God should be a comfort to your soul. Just as God knew the sins of the, the church of Ephesus, the church of Pergamum, the church of Thyatira. In fact, remember in Thyatira, he says, he has eyes like a flame of fire and feet like burnished bronze. He sees through your cover-up. He knew the sins of Ephesus, Pergamum, Thyatira, and Sardis, and Laodicea. He also knows the faithfulness and the suffering of Philadelphia and Smyrna. Psalm 56, 8 reminds us that God keeps our tears in a bottle. They're recorded in his books. The psalm tells us that he's near to the brokenhearted. He's near to the brokenhearted. Faithful Christian, if you are pressing on in the midst of hardship, maybe it's a physical hardship, maybe it's an illness that isn't going away, maybe it's a relational hardship, maybe it's something at work, Maybe it's actual persecution or at least being ostracized or cut out of the loop because you're taking a stand for righteousness. Whatever it is, press on. The Lord knows. He's near to you. He knows. 
And you might feel alone. You might feel like he's not there. He is there. He is with you in the fire and in the flood. And be encouraged, he's imminently arriving. Our fifth sub-point, he is imminently arriving. Verse 11, he says, I am coming soon. I am coming soon. Now, if you're like me, highly literal, you look at the word soon and you say, hold on, this was written 2,000 years ago, or almost 2,000 years ago. Nothing has changed. As and maybe you might be inching close to what Peter writes about in Second Peter, where the scoffers say, where is the promise of his coming? Well, he's on his way. As we look at the word soon throughout the New Testament, the word soon does not necessarily refer to chronology, but refers to the idea of imminence. Now, when we talk about soon, I could tell you that football season is soon. I don't count preseason as football season, right? It doesn't count. Those guys aren't really going to make the team. It is soon. It's not here yet. It's coming. But when we talk about the arrival of Christ, it's what James talks about in James chapter 4. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Right there. Could enter into the room at any moment. I use the illustration with the high school students of the ancient Greek tale of the sword of Damocles. King Damocles was a Greek king who committed some crime. And his punishment was every day he had to sit on a throne. And underneath the throne was a razor sharp sword hung by a thin thread that could break at any moment. That was Damocles' punishment. The torture of sitting under that sword knowing all it would take was just the thread to give away. And that sword would plummet down into his skull. That's the idea of imminence. But whereas the tale of the sword of Damocles is terrifying, the imminence of Christ's return should be encouraging. It could happen at any moment. It could happen today. It could happen before I'm done preaching. It could happen in a hundred years. But there is nothing left to be fulfilled for Jesus to come for his church. The rapture in which Christ gathers his children unto himself could happen at any time. Behold, he is coming soon. Take heart and trust his goodness. He's all wise and all powerful. So if he doesn't come today, then he has a reason. There's a purpose. If he's left you here presently in your trial and in your suffering and in your sorrow and in your hardship, then there's a reason. He hasn't taken you home yet. Your present condition is what is best for you. If something had been better for you, God would have done it because he never makes a mistake and nothing is beyond his control. If you have questions about the purpose of your suffering, I'd refer you to the wonderful sermon Hadley preached a few weeks ago on the sovereignty of God over our suffering on Sunday nights. You need to go back and listen to that. That was excellent. So our first question, who is Jesus in relation to the faithful Christian? Secondly, what does Jesus guarantee to the faithful Christian? What does Jesus guarantee for the faithful Christian? What does he promise to do for you, Christian? Because the promises of God fuel your hope. Well, first, he says in verse 8, Behold, I've set before you, Church of Philadelphia, I've set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. Continuing the theme of his omnipotence, his all power, his strength, and his might, he has placed before the Philadelphians an open door. A door to do what? Well, we see this phrase often in Paul's epistles. He says, pray for us that a door would be open for us to share the gospel. Uh, He also writes that a door was open for us to bring the gospel to this people group or to that people group. Luke echoes the same terminology in the Gospel of Acts. A door was open for us to do ministry. This could be a door for ministry, which every Christian, not even just pastors, but every Christian should be thinking about daily. We are all called to be ministers in our own way, sharing the gospel, showing the love of Christ to those around us by word and by deed. Perhaps it's an open door for ministry. I think, though, given the context, this is an open door for perseverance, pressing on, holding up in the face of hardship, in the face of persecution. Paul writes to the Corinthians that no matter what the situation is, no matter what the temptation, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man, and God is faithful. He will make a way. 
He will make a way of escape that you may hold up. You never, true believer, you never have to sin. No matter what the situation. A difficult relationship. A difficult work situation. A child who's rebelling and grieving your heart. No matter what it is, you never have to give in to sin. You never have to give in to frustration or complaining or bitterness of soul. God sets before you an open door. You can press on. You can persevere. Even in the face of persecution. This brings to mind the prototype way that God made. The one story that all of the Old Testament so often harkens back to. The story that you have known since Sunday school in flannel graph. Exodus chapter 14. Turn over to Exodus chapter 14. The time that God made a way where it seemed like no way could be made. And our first sub point here, I forgot to mention it, he establishes our paths. He establishes our paths. And we see the prototype of this in Exodus 14. Moses has led the people of Israel out of Egypt And there was great rejoicing. They plundered the Egyptians without having to lift a weapon. They took the gold and the jewelry which their Egyptian neighbors freely gave to them. And they went into the wilderness, but rejoicing soon turned to panic. Fear. I have a hard time when my four kids are either crying or sinning or complaining or whatever, all at the same time, I'm like, I can't do this. I can't imagine Moses having three million people crying, sinning, and complaining all at the same time. But that's I, now, now I no wonder why he, he says, like, Lord, just kill me, right? No. Verse 10, <laughs> Exodus 14, verse 10, when Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. I mean, they're forgetting the ten plagues that just happened. And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you only have to be silent. God made a way. He parted the Red Sea and allowed three million Israelites to walk through unharmed, and then he brought that same Red Sea crashing down on the Egyptian army, drowning Pharaoh, his chariots, and his soldiers. God makes a way. How does he do that for the Christian? He opens doors for ministry all the time. But as we're reminded, he also makes a way so that you can press on in righteousness. No matter what the situation is, you do not have to give in to sin. You do not have to give in to anger or frustration or grumbling or complaining. He sets before you an open door. You need to walk through it in obedience. He establishes our paths. Secondly, he fights our battles. He fights our battles. Go back to Revelation. Go from Exodus all the way back to Revelation. The Lord says, Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Now this echoes the same type of persecution that was going on in the church of Smyrna. Verse 9 of chapter 2, you can flip back there. Revelation 2, 9, I know your tribulation, Lord, to the church of Smyrna. I know your tribulation and your poverty and the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. What is going on here? Well, in every major town throughout the ancient Near East during this time would be communities of Jews. And the Jews who had not repented and embraced Jesus as the Messiah were still convinced in their spiritual blindness that they were righteous, that they were still God's chosen people. God still loves the Jews and will bring them to repentance in the tribulation. But if they had not embraced the Messiah, then at this point in history, they were not part of the people of God. The people of God are those who had embraced Jesus as the Messiah. But because Jews at this time, who were part of Judaism, enjoyed certain political privileges within the Roman Empire, they often would wield those political privileges to inflict persecution through the Roman system upon Christians, Christians who did not enjoy the same type of political privileges. 
So what's most likely going on here, both in Philadelphia and Smyrna, is the community of Jews are somehow inflicting persecution on genuine believers who could be both Jewish and Gentile. What they have in common is that they've bowed the knee to Jesus Christ. They're inflicting persecution on them, all the while thinking they're doing the Lord's work. Jesus says, Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not. They're not truly part of his people, but lie. Behold, I will make them come down and bow before your feet. How did this happen? We don't exactly know. Don't exactly know how this happened, if it happened at that point in time in history, or if it's still waiting for the day where the Lord will make every knee bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But at some point, whether it happened in a specific miraculous way in Philadelphia 2,000 years ago, or it's still yet to come, the Lord will get victory because he does fight our battles. I was feeling a little under the weather yesterday and I was laying on the couch watching Prince Caspian, 2008 Disney movie. I love the Chronicles of Narnia. And, you know, I'm one of those people who pedantically says the book is always better than the movie because the book is always better than the movie, without question. However, the movie did get something right that I really appreciate. In this movie, Prince Caspian, there's a scene near the end of the movie where the bad guy army is in retreat and they are fleeing towards the river and they are coming up to a bridge. And at the end of the bridge is just this little girl, Lucy. She's the main character in many of the books. She's got the closest relationship with Aslan the lion, who is the Christ figure in the books of Narnia. And Lucy's just standing there all by herself at the end of the bridge. Little girl, like eight, nine, ten. And she just has a little dagger. She's holding her little dagger. And all this massive army of villains with their spears and swords, they start laughing. Because what challenge is a little girl with a dagger to them? But then everything changes. Because behind her appears Aslan. And the presence of Aslan alone changes the entire tide of the battle. You are weak. You don't have power. In fact, the Lord identifies the Church of Philadelphia, you have but a little power. That's a nice way of saying you really have got nothing. But he's the one who fights for you. He establishes our paths. He fights our battles. And he vindicates our righteousness. Jesus says, Behold, I'll make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I'll make them come down and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Psalm 3, David writes the psalm while he's on the run from Absalom. Many are saying of my soul, there is no hope for God in him. And maybe you have friends or relatives or neighbors who think you're part of a cult. You're too zealous. You take this Jesus stuff too seriously. You're too fanatical. You don't know the right truth. You're not truly part of God's people. Friend, I can tell you on the authority of the word of God, if you have confessed your sins, repented from your sins, bowed the knee to Jesus Christ, cast all on him, you are part of the family of God, no matter what the world says, and at the right time, he will vindicate your righteousness. It's an alien righteousness that he gives to you, but it's your righteousness nonetheless, because it has been given to you. And at the right time, he will make that clear. Psalm 43, verse 1, the psalmist prays to the Lord, vindicate me, O God. As we read through Ezekiel, one thing God says over and over and over to the people of Judah, that at the right time when he brings judgment on Judah's enemies, one thing the enemies will know, they will know that I am the Lord and that you, Judah, are mine. He vindicates your righteousness. You may be slandered and cast down and cast out by others right now, but at the right time when he sees fit, he will bring forth your righteousness. He will vindicate you. Fourth subpoint, and this subpoint has subpoints. He spares our future. Look at verse ten with me. We don't have a ton of time. He spares our future. He says, because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. This is one of the most amazing promises of the book of Revelation. Lord Jesus is coming for his people. We believe that a time is coming called the tribulation in which God will bring judgment on this sinful and wicked world. It is a literal seven-year period We are confident that it is a literal seven-year period referred to as Daniel's 70th week. Where do we get that? Daniel chapter 9. 
70 weeks are decreed. 69 weeks happened from the moment of that prophecy to Jesus' triumphal entry when he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. 69 sevens perfectly happened from the time the Jews returned from exile. Sorry, not from the moment of the prophecy, but that they were very close. From the time the Jews returned from exile to the time that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey in the triumphal entry at the Passion Week, 69 sevens, 69 groups of seven, 69 weeks, perfectly. And then there was a break, because Daniel 9 tells us there will be a prince who was cut off and had nothing. You know the prince who was cut off and had nothing, Jesus Christ. As he hung on the cross and he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he yielded up his spirit and he cried out and he gave up his spirit. The veil was torn in two and that inaugurated a pause, which we call the church age. God is doing a new work. He's not cast off Israel forever, but he has set them aside. He used to work through his people Israel. Now he works through the church. And right now, during the time of the Gentiles, he is working through the church, the church age, or the time of the Gentiles. But there's one more week left to go. One more set of sevens. Another set of seven years that's still coming, referred to as Daniel's 70th week. That's clearly described in the book of Revelation because one half of it is referred to as 42 months and another half is referred to as 1,260 days, which is also 42 months if you go by the Jewish reckoning where one month is exactly 30 days. We know that the tribulation has to be a literal seven-year period. It's not figurative. It's not ephemeral or amorphous. It is actual and concrete. 42 months and 42 months with a significant midpoint in the middle. Seven years according to a Jewish reckoning. And Jesus says, I'm going to keep you from that. Faithful Christian. Remember, it's written not to you, but for you. Both the Philadelphians and for you, believer, now. I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. He spares our future. Now we're going to do a short excursus. And by short, I mean short. What is an excursus? It's a fancy word for a hopefully helpful tangent. How can we be confident that Revelation 3.10 indicates a pre-tribulational rapture? We'll go through these quickly. If you want my notes, email me. Um, yeah, my email is Josue at gbchutch.com. No, seriously, Josue is like... Whatever I know about eschatology, he knows like 50 times more. He's so excited to get here. I text with him often. We're really getting a gem in Hostway. Anyway, first point. Why do, we, why do we know this is a pre-trib rapture? One, because the Bible clearly teaches that there will be a rapture. Nobody doubts that there will be a rapture. It doesn't matter what form of eschatological system you hold to. Whether you are covenantal, amil, pre-mill, pre-trib, mid-trib, whatever, everybody knows there will be a rapture. 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 52, that's the passage that says, Behold, we shall not sleep, but we shall all be changed. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the trumpet will sound, the dead of Christ will rise first. You guys know that passage. 1 Corinthians 15, also 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, clearly teaches a rapture. God will harpazo, the Greek term, to snatch away, to bring to himself. Nobody disputes, who, nobody who believes the Bible disputes that a rapture will happen. It's just when and to what extent. What will it look like? Well, the text tells us that it will happen. God will call his people to himself. At some point, Jesus will come and take his church to be with him as he promised in John 14. John 14, verse 3, one of my professors pointed this out. Jesus literally promises the rapture in the upper room. If I go, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. The question is, when will it happen? We'll try to deal with that very quickly soon. Second point, why do we know this is pre-trib? Because Revelation 3.10 and also 1 Thessalonians 1.10 teach us that Jesus will rescue Christians from the wrath that is to come. That does not refer to hell. That refers to a coming wrath, something that is not here yet. Hell is going on right now. But this is the wrath that is to come, something that is future, not yet. Both 1 Thess 1.10 and Revelation 3.10 say that Jesus delivers us from the wrath to come. The events of the tribulation are clearly referred to as the wrath of God or the wrath of the Lamb. Point three, because all of the theories regarding the time of the rapture during a literal seven-year tribulation, uh, the pre-tribulation rapture is the one that is most strongly supported by Scripture. There are four major views. Two of them we can essentially lump together. The four major views are the pre-tribulational rapture, the mid-tribulational rapture, the post-tribulational rapture, and the pre-wrath rapture.
pre-wrath and mid-trib are slightly different, but they share many crucial similarities that we can lump them together. But first, let's look at post-tribulational rapture. Post-tribulational rapture teaches that the rapture of the church happens right at the end of the tribulation. That Christians are expected to go all the way through the tribulation, and then the Lord calls us up, and then we come back down. Like, dirt, dirt, right? Yes. That's not, it, that doesn't work at all for several reasons. Um, Paul Benware, who writes a book that Pastor Bart loves, Understanding End Times Prophecy, I'd recommend that to you. It's a great book. Bart would love to buy it for you. Uh, five reasons why the rapture is not the second coming. These things cannot happen continuously. They don't happen at the same time. They're not the same event. It doesn't make sense for the rapture to happen right at the end of the tribulation, immediately preceding the second coming. Five reasons for that. And yes, my subpoint has subpoints at some points. Just jot this down if you want. Five reasons. One, place of meeting. At the rapture, believers meet Christ in the air. At the second coming, the Lord goes all the way down to the Mount of Olives. None of the second coming passages refer to meeting Jesus in the air. But they do talk about Jesus going all the way down to the Mount of Olives and staying there. Right? So place of meeting different. We meet Lord in the air at the rapture. He comes down to the Mount of Olives. Secondly, purpose. Ben Ware writes that at the rapture, the Lord comes to bless his people with the final aspect of their salvation. The rapture passages contain no warnings of judgment. However, the second coming passages emphasize impending judgment for unbelievers, specifically the judgment of the sheep and the goats, which is talked about in the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24 and 25. Third, mention of the millennial kingdom. All of the rapture passages, there is no mention of the establishment of the millennial kingdom. However, the second coming passages, after the judgment of the sheep and the goats, they emphasize the institution of the millennial kingdom. Very different in, the, in regards to the millennial kingdom. Fourth, the idea of imminence. The rapture passages all indicate that this could happen at any time. Benware writes, with the rapture of the Lord's coming is seen as imminent. It could happen any moment. But many signs and events still must happen before the second coming such as Joel mentions in Joel 2, uh, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision before the great and terrible day of the Lord. That's the second coming. The battle of Armageddon, the armies have to be gathered before. So there are signs that happen before the second coming, including celestial signs. The sign of the Son of Man in sky happens before the second coming, but not before the rapture. That's at any moment. Fifth, finally, the results. At the rapture, the Lord returns to heaven with his saints. At the second coming, the Lord Jesus descends and remains on earth. What do we do? We can throw out post-trib. Let's look at mid-trib and pre-wrath. Again, they are different, but you can lump them together. One of the major tenets of the mid-trib and the pre-wrath rapture view is that Jesus comes in the middle of tribulation, and we go through what's called the wrath of man, what many people call, uh, even though there's not much biblical support for that term, but we're spared from the wrath of God. This ignores the fact that two-thirds, two-thirds of the judgments, the seals and the trumpets, happen in the first half of the tribulation. They come directly from heaven, and yet they're not referred to in this view as the wrath of God. And it only reviews the bold judgments that happen in the second half of the tribulation as the wrath of God. It also ignores the fact that in Revelation 6.16, the seal and trumpet judgments are referred to as the wrath of the Lamb, not the wrath of man, but the wrath of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, who is God. And it also goes against Revelation 15.1, which says that the bold judgments, the start of the bold judgments, finish the wrath of God, meaning that the wrath of God has already begun. So one of the central tenets of, pre of, I'm sorry, of mid-trib and pre-wrath is that we're spared from the wrath of God, but we go through the wrath of man, that is not true. We're spared from all of it. This is why we hold to pre-tribulational rapture. Fourth, on this point right up here, the massive worldwide scope and purpose of the judgment Jesus describes in Revelation 3.10. The scope and judgment. Jesus says, I will keep you out of it. Nothing like this has ever happened before. But as you read through the book of Revelation, I mean, as bad as coronavirus has been, it does not hold a candle to what's going to happen in the book of Revelation. Jesus says, I will keep you from that hour of judgment that comes on the whole earth. And that actually connects to our fifth point, the grammar. The grammar that Jesus uses, the specific term, I will keep you from, tereo ek, literally means you will not go through it. Ek, you know ek, it's right there. Exit, out of. Ekklesia, those who are called out of. Tereo ek. Jesus is very specific in his grammar. We hold to a pre-tribulational rapture because it's what the Bible teaches. Back to our outline. He spares our future, and he secures our eternity. He secures our eternity. The Lord Jesus says, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, in my own new name. 
This echoes Psalm 23, verse 6, which says, Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We won't turn there right now, but in Revelation 21, you need to read it. It will encourage your soul. Revelation 21, John sees the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, the holy city from God where we will live forever, this massive cube-shaped city. There will be plenty of room for all the saints from all of history, Old Testament, New Testament history, to live there. And tribulation saints as well will live there with God forever. We'll be a pillar in the temple of God. There's something very interesting in verse 22 of Revelation 21. There is no temple. John says there is no temple, but God himself is the temple. What does it mean to be a pillar in the temple of God forever? It doesn't mean you're going to be a column in a building. It means you will be firmly fixed in relationship and fellowship with the God of the universe forever, enjoying his company, enjoying his presence, just no sin. We sing it, on that day when freed from sinning, I will see thy lovely face. That's what it is to be a pillar in the temple of God forever. And he'll put his name on you. A name signifies ownership. His name, the name of Jesus, and the name of the new Jerusalem, this one is mine. A forever certified citizen of the new Jerusalem. He secures your eternity. Which brings us to our last question, which we will do very quickly. So what does Jesus expect of you, faithful Christian? What does he expect of you, faithful Christian? What should he look for and see in you? This doesn't earn his protection. It's a free gift. But if you are one who's been changed and been born again, transformed, what should we see in you? Well, what do we see in the Philadelphians? First, he expects habitual obedience. Jesus says, you have but little power, yet you have kept my word. And then verse 13, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We know from the New Testament, James 1.22, to hear is to obey. If you don't actually obey, you haven't really heard. But obedience should mark the Christian, not perfection, but a pattern. The audit of your life. If someone were to follow you around at your job, how you talk with your kids, how you use your free time, how you spend your money, they would be able to tell what you love, what you value, and who you obey. Not perfection, but direction. Do you abide in Christ? Do you walk in Christ? God expects habitual obedience from those who have been changed and born again. Secondly, he expects, expects courageous loyalty. He says, you have not denied my name. This is not like Peter's denial, although Peter's denial was serious and grave. This is like Judas's denial, or Demas, or the second and third soil, who hear the word and they receive it with joy, but they have no root in themselves because they love the things of this world and they forsake and they never come back. 2 Timothy 2, 11-13, if we deny him, he will deny us. To deny in this sense is to forsake forever. It's like the people in the book of Hebrews. To save their own skin, they went back to Judaism. They said, you know what? I don't need the Messiah. I'm good. You do that, you cut your way off from eternal life. He expects habitual obedience. He expects courageous loyalty. He expects steadfast perseverance. He says to them, verse 10, because you have kept my word about patient endurance. Verse 8, you kept my word. That refers to general obedience. This is specific. You kept my word about patient endurance. To remain under, to hold up under to persevere under trial. James chapter 1. James says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. James chapter 1 verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Which brings us to our fourth point. He expects lifelong fidelity. Jesus says to the church in Philadelphia, Hold fast to what you have, so that no one may seize your crown. If you forsake God... If you deny Christ permanently, not temporarily, but permanently, it shows you had no part in him. Paul's confidence as he was on death row, he said, I'm being poured out like a drink offering. 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. I fought the good fight. I finished the, faith, finished the race. I've kept the faith. And there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which God has awarded those who love his appearing. The crown is waiting for you. But if you flee permanently, if you turn your back on Christ once and for all, you do not hold fast to what you have, or at least what you thought you have, and it shows that you had no crown waiting for you, though you assumed you had one. Lastly, Jesus expects childlike trust. Verse 12, he says, to the one who conquers. You say, what does that have to do with trust? Remember who's writing this, John. 1 John 5, verse 4 through 5, John tells us what it means to conquer for a Christian. You're like Lucy on the bridge with Aslan behind you. You can't beat that army. 
but the one who fights for you can. And what does John say in 1 John 5, 4? This is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. You trust the one who is infinitely stronger than you. The one who conquers has Christ's protection forever. Friend, if that's not you, you need to repent from your sin today. You need to flee to Christ, the perfect sacrifice, the one who lived where you have sinned all the time. He lived perfectly, totally obeyed the law, never sinned once, perfectly satisfied God's requirements on your behalf. And then he died the death you deserve to die. Not just the physical death, although that was very much important, but the wrath of God poured out on him as darkness covered the land for three hours. The cup of God's wrath, which is described to us, he drank in full on the cross. He went through hell so that you wouldn't have to. If you're not protected by him, if you don't see these features of your life, what God expects of a faithful Christian, if you only see hypocrisy and sin, flee to him today. And he will be all the things that he was in relation to the Philadelphians. He'll be that to you and he will guarantee to you all the things he guaranteed to them. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time this morning. We pray, Lord, that we would be faithful to the end as we look to you to come back for us. Pray this in your name. Amen.